Thank you. So when to use the REST API? So as Monique just said, uh, my name's Sean Blakely. I'm a senior uh, technical architect at Pragmatic, which is a UK uh, WordPress agency. I work largely on enterprise Scrum-based uh, and I've been working with uh, WordPress, as Monique said, for about a dozen years or so. So this talk is, is aimed mainly at people who are uh, considering using the API in their projects, or indeed are sort of tentatively using the, their, the API in their existing projects. So what I'd like to look at is why the API, the REST API, is important. I'd then like to look at uh, what the... Uh, sorry, guys, there's some animation on these slides. Is it possible to put it into presenter mode? I'll, I'll carry on talking while we're just waiting. Um, I'm going to talk about... Uh, what an API is, so we'll look at a sort of overview of uh, a, a couple of metaphors of what APIs are, and then we'll move on to look at when to use the API. So we'll look at some examples of when we've used the API. And then briefly, we'll look at what tomorrow may mean, so what the REST API may mean for WordPress tomorrow. So why is the REST API important? Well, I think it's important for for a couple of reasons. So firstly, it's important to, to us, the community, to developers. And secondly, it's important to WordPress itself. So prior to uh, the REST API, WordPress was a, a monolithic application. It was essentially a, a black box where uh, data wasn't able to come in, data couldn't come out. It controlled the, the publishing sort of process, end-to-end -end, uh, process from beginning to end. Now, the REST API changed that. The REST API allowed us to move data into the system, but it also allowed us to move data out of the system. So it really liberated our data out of that, uh, out of WordPress itself and made it uh, platform agnostic. So we were able to start integrating with other services uh, and other systems. And then why the REST API is important for WordPress? Well. This is a breakdown of uh, adoption of uh, content management systems. And so WordPress has a seemingly unassailable dominance in the marketplace within CMSs. But counterintuitively, this actually creates a vulnerability for WordPress. So these were some ideas introduced by uh, Christian, uh, Clayton Christensen, who talked about the uh, innovator's dilemma. And what he was saying is that when you dominate a market to such a degree, you actually become vulnerable to the agility of these smaller pieces of software or smaller organizations that are much more nimble and much quicker to disrupt the marketplace. And being the, the dominant player, you're not able to adjust quickly and you're not able to adjust your position. And so you become vulnerable to that agility. And so his uh, recommendation, his solution for that problem was what he called the um, uh, disruptive innovation. So that's where you start challenging your own position. So WordPress starts challenging its own dominance and deliberately disrupting its own position. Now, that's exactly what the REST API does. It starts challenging our position. And indeed, it's exactly what Gutenberg does as well. So what is uh, the REST API? Well, I like to, sorry, just for a moment, is there any chance we could put it into presentation mode because there is some animation on the slides? I'll, I'll leave that with you guys if that's possible. Great, thank you. So I often think about uh, an API as similar to a, a power socket in a wall. So whilst it has lots of potential and offers us uh, power, it really doesn't become useful until we actually plug something into that, into that power socket. So this slide isn't going to make any sense to you at all, because this is animated as we gently move from one section to the other. Let me try and recreate it for you. So you might have to close your eyes and imagine this as I walk you through it. So I've recently just got back from Guatemala. My wife is, is Guatemalan, so we're go going there to visit family. And it got me thinking about APIs and, and connecting systems in this way. So behind the WordPress logo is me. And over there is my father-in-law. Now, my father-in-law speaks a, a smattering of English, you know, a few words that he remembers from, from his primary school days. And my Spanish is criminally bad. 
So it's really difficult for us to, to communicate, but he's got things that I'm really interested in. So I'm really interested in Latin culture, in the, the music and the food uh, and the sort of parties, the fiestas. And equally, he's interested in English culture. So he thinks he doesn't understand why we all drink warm beer in England, for example. He's interested in fish and chips, and he genuinely thinks that we're all pirates in England. And so my poor wife, who's in the middle here, has to bounce between my father-in-law and me, trying to translate as I'm speaking English, or terrible, terrible Spanish, and my father-in-law is speaking Spanish, so she's translating back to English. So this is a bit like an API, but we can do a bit better than this. So imagine that I and my father-in-law uh, decide to, to learn a shared language. So let's say that that's uh, Pidgin Esperanto. So we decide to learn this shared language. Well, now my wife can put her feet up. She doesn't need to translate anymore because we can communicate via this shared language. Now, this slide would be animating as we're talking. So what we would see is a transition to WordPress. This might be a COBOL install. And of course, it's unlikely. And of course, our Pidgin Esperanto would be JSON and wouldn't be Pidgin Esperanto. And we're not going to be talking about pirates and pinatas. We're going to be talking about user objects and legacy data tables and so on. So when to use the REST API? And I'd like to give you uh, a couple of uh, a few architectural examples, so ways that we've utilized the REST API to help us create uh, an elaborate architectural solutions where WordPress is really part of that solution. And then we'll talk and look at some specific use cases where we've used uh, the, the REST API. So WordPress is part of the solution. This, and again, I'll, I'll talk you through this. This is a, a startup company. This is a, a sports startup company. And this company is interested in promoting information around uh, sports that aren't necessarily in the public eye. So the, Football and rugby and cricket and so on, the most popular sports. But there's a, a huge long tail of other sports that there's a lot of interest in. And so this company wants to promote those sports. So they're really interested in using that classic uh, and the traditional WordPress. The content team will be creating content within the WordPress space. They'll then be enriching that within WordPress, so adding their taxonomies and uh, uh, images and, and so on and then pushing that out into the, uh, to the front end of the website. However, this presents us with a, a few issues, because one of the things they also want to do is to ingest a news feed. So that news feed might be uh, the press wires or might be from other sources, but these are articles that they want to pull down into the system. They want to select the articles that they want to publish on the, on the site. They want to enrich them, but also add a sort of summary and contextualize those those articles. Now, this presents us with a challenge because we have some performance issues around this. Now, this our WordPress layer, our business layer, is um, doing running a subscription. It's running a, a, a sort of you know the user management and all sorts of other heavy lifting within this website. So to then start ingesting this feed as well, we're going to start putting pressure on that core system. So it's we're likely to hit some performance issues creating pulling this into WordPress. Equally, we're going to hit some scalability issues. So as new sports are brought online, we're going to start exponentially growing this uh, system. And this architecture isn't going to support that growth. And then the third thing that would be a real concern is that if you're taking this news feed and pulling it directly into WordPress, you're very vulnerable to any changes that are happening in this, 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 the source. So anything that's happening in the news feed you're not protecting your system from those changes. So what we'll be implementing, so the architecture that we'll be using is creating a content API. So this API will be a, a sort of node server that will be ingesting those news stories, so pulling those in from, uh, from the press wires or from whatever the source is. WordPress will then be pulling in from that content API. So we're protecting ourselves here with an abstraction layer. So if there are changes from the source, we can make those changes in the content API. We don't need to change anything in our WordPress layer. And then we can push those articles. So once the, 
the content team have, have enriched them as they need to. We can then push them to a published sector of the uh, section of the content API. And the value of doing this is it then frees us up to change our front end technology. So we might use React or Vue and so on. But we can also push to other services. So that might be a newsletter um, service or a dedicated app and so on. So let's take another look at a slightly different example. So this is um, WordPress as an API delivery system. So this is a, a simpler architecture where WordPress could do the heavy lifting here because we're not doing any uh, sort of user management or e-commerce and so on. This is for a, a startup company that were wanting to show details about swimming pools all over the world. So that you might be in Belgrade and you're looking for a swimming pool close to this venue that's open after 7 o'clock. So as you put those uh, details in, so the system would return you relevant details. However, there was no website at the front of this uh, project. There was no website to query. It was a publicly queryable API. So you might be pulling this down from another site, from a widget or some, some other sort of service, and you'd be pulling that relevant information in. So we were able to rely on WordPress to do this heavy lifting, but we did consider some performance issues, and those issues were around data retrieval. So when we were doing these unique searches where you're combining a number of parameters before then returning the results, we were finding quite a slow performance issue. So we used the, the API. We, we integrated with a service called Elasticsearch, which is a, a, a sort of flat distributed um, storage system, which then returns almost lightning fast um, results. So we were then able to, to complement the WordPress architecture and start moving our, our data storage and improving the data storage. So in this example, although we're using WordPress as the graphical interface, so the way that the content team are uploading their content is via WordPress, we've actually decoupled the front end. So this is the, a headless CMS. And we've also uh, changed the storage system, so using an alternative storage system. So let's have a look at integrating with existing systems. Now, this is a project uh, by uh, Human Made. This is the Fairfax project. Now, Fairfax are a large Australian publishing company. And they have an existing content API with over a million uh, articles within that content API, and also an existing media API. And I think that has uh, well over a million multimedia entries, which then connects to a, a cloud service. That's Cloudinary that's storing those images. Now, what Fairfax were interested in was utilizing that, uh, the publishing uh, flow, so the workflow of WordPress. They were interested in their journalists and for their editors to be able to utilize WordPress as their interface, but then wanted to utilize their existing architecture and to integrate with their existing architecture, so the content API and the, and the media API. So that's exactly what they did. They utilized the content API, allowed journalists to create stories in the normal way, or pull them down from this dedicated content API. The editors, once they were uh, flagged for review, the editors could then pull them down, enrich them with the uh, images and the taxonomies and so on that were required, and then they would push them to this published section of the content API. And then a React front end, so the, the front end would be pulling in this data from the, the REST API and also pulling in uh, images from the media library. And so what we see in these three examples is that each time the client has requested WordPress as the core graphical interface that they want their content teams to work in. So the architecture that sits around WordPress, be it the storage or the front end, changes for each project to adapt to the requirements of the client. But that core experience for the content teams are consistent and is within WordPress. So let's have a look at some examples of, of working with WordPress. So I like to think of working with the API as being as easy as Pi. And by that, I mean presenting, integrating, and experimenting. So let's have a look at uh, the first example of presenting. So this is a plugin that I've work, been working on for a while. This is a plugin called Site in Numbers. And what this does is presents to a site owner, indeed their users, all sorts of information, data, and revealing statistics about their site. So it might be 
telling them the total word count of the entire site, giving you a breakdown of where that content is, giving you an insight into the publishing times, uh, the publishing days, your most popular and successful content, and so on and so forth. So trying to give a sort of big data visualization and an opportunity to understand your, your site uh, in more depth. And so the way that this is structured is we have an administrative uh, interface, a graphical interface, where the site owner can drop and drag these different sections that they want to show onto the front page. We then have our business layer. So this is uh, our API, REST API construction sort of layer, where we're creating a, a large JSON object. And that JSON object contains all our statistics and all our data and all our raw data. And then that's pulled into the front end, so pulled into our JavaScript layer, which then constructs that data into uh, the sort of uh, visually rich uh, charts and so on that we're presenting to the, the end user. So let's have a look at another example. This is uh, a project called I Am Team GB. This is a project that Pragmatic worked on with um, ITV and the National Lottery and the British Olympic Association. And so this was a... a Introducing Britain's biggest sports days. There were many thousands of events happening simultaneously around the UK. And among many of the challenges that they presented us with was uh, enabling a user to put in a search, so you could search wherever you were in, in the UK, and we would then return you relevant events within distance from your front door. So the way that we did this was that we, and again, I'll talk you through this. You're missing the animation, unfortunately. Um, so we use WordPress as our core uh, to do the sort of the, the, the core of the site. We had our JavaScript layer. So as you input your uh, city, let's say, uh, well, it has to be in the UK, let's say Liverpool, as you inputted your city, we would fire a request out to, to Google Maps API. We'd make sure that where you were searching for was in the UK. We'd then get your longitude and latitude coordinates, fire that back in via the, the REST API into the back of the system. And what we'd done in the back had chunked the UK into sections. So as we had many thousands of events, to make it a manageable uh, load, we took and chunked the country into a number of sections and then pushed that data and pulled that data back into, into the JavaScript layer and then presented it to the, to the end user. And this would happen in a a matter of milliseconds um, as a user experience. So using the REST API to integrate uh, with systems. So what you're seeing here is uh, sage.com, uh, the sage.com home site. Now this uh, home page, now this is a, a Sitecore site, uh, so run in .NET. However, almost everything you're seeing on the screen is coming from WordPress, and it's coming from a WordPress site. So, Within Sage, there's a, a number of systems, an ecosystem that has a number of different um, content management systems and different solutions, of which WordPress is one, and it runs there at uh, the Sage Advice service. So we created an endpoint for any of the ecosystem, anywhere within the Sage ecosystem, to pull and request relevant contextualized um, data and, and sort of results and posts. So as you can see here, we had an endpoint where and this was, uh, turned out to be quite important for the system that it was an opt-in solution. So you could add as few of these parameters as you wanted. So you might just define a category. And so we would return you uh, relevant results to that category, but you could add a, a multitude of, of different uh, parameters. And so you'd be turning up the relevancy of the results that were returned to you. And so sat behind this endpoint was what we were calling a relevancy engine, where we would take all those parameters to so take all your search parameters, and then start scoring, so essentially creating a league table of rele relevancy and then returning those results. And so what this enabled us to do was to create this uh, a number of connection points. So these are touch points between the different systems. So a Sitecore site on the left here and the WordPress site on the right. Sitecore might be showing content that's actually generated by the WordPress site and vice versa. So what we're creating are these numerous touch points across these two different systems. And it leads to a, a seamless uh, user experience where the user has no idea that there's actually two different systems built in 
uh, completely different solutions and different languages because it's an entirely seamless experience for them as they're moving from one system into the other. And indeed, there's portions of each site which are being delivered by the, the other system. So let's have a look at experimenting. Now, unfortunately, you're not going to see this animated, but I shall again briefly talk you through this. So this is a, uh, an Ionic app, uh, and this app is run by WordPress. So behind this app, where we can uh, do full CRUD rights, so we can create and edit and so on, a WordPress site is running that information. So you will have seen, if this was running, that uh, I think we've got a, a, there's a, uh, an article that's uh, around Charles Darwin, and so we add the name Charles to, uh, to that article. And then what you see is that that then persists into the WordPress install. So we're making a change within uh, an app on your smartphone, and that change is persisting within WordPress. And that really takes us back to that point we were, we were looking at very early, early in the talk when we were talking about that free flow of information where data can move freely into WordPress and move freely out of WordPress. And that's exactly what's happening here is that we're really um, removing the reliance of our data on WordPress, and it's becoming platform agnostic as we can be changing it, uh, editing it, and uh, moving it within the, um, within the ecosystem of our whole, whole service. So this is an example of a sli something slightly different. This was a, we challenged ourselves to start thinking about WordPress in a different way, and thinking about ways that we could use REST API to um, experiment with WordPress in ways that maybe we hadn't before. And so we decided to set the challenge of creating WordPress as a game engine. Uh, and what could we do? Could we create a game uh, using WordPress? So the, the game or the type of game that we settled on was a, a football management simulation. And so we created uh, these tournaments like the World Cup. Uh, yeah, you might have uh, teams, and so the team object uh, is linked to a league, so tournament objects, and in turn they might be linked to a country object, and you have players, and so on and so forth. So it's a really interesting exercise to think about this interconnectivity, this, this lattice of, of objects and data and how they interconnect. But we used the REST API to solve the problem of time within the game. So it's a, it was an interesting challenge to try and think about creating a time machine and how time would persist in this virtual world. And so we created an endpoint where we would fire this time machine, which we, we called Herbert, and we would fire this um, API request. Our machine, our time machine, would then sort of move on, and we could fire events in the game. So that might be uh, a, a World Cup fixture or a injury to your best player or, or whatever it might be. So this is, and I'm sure a lot of you recognize this, this is the Gutenberg interface. Now, this is something that I've been thinking about for a, for a while, that as we've modularized our build files, so we think of our sort of SAS partials and our JavaScript files as we break them into to modular chunks, so I think that our content has the opportunity to, to do the same modularization to our content. So I often think of of posts and pages within, um, within WordPress as being like that black box, so that sort of self-contained black box that we were talking about before, as, as WordPress was before the REST API. Well, so posts and pages are at the moment. They're really a sort of binary. You're either displaying the content or you're not. But Gutenberg gives us the opportunity to change that. So Gutenberg splits our content into discrete blocks. And one of the really positive consequences of that is that we can then access those discrete blocks and start displaying them and, and manipulating them in different ways. And so one of the things that we've been uh, experimenting with is something called the content, or what we're calling content tags. So much as you think at the post level, you add post tags, well, we would add content tags, so contents to individual blocks. And so what we'd be able to do is then create these dynamic pages which are generated from those content tags, and so we could pull out hyper-relevant blocks around the, that you've searched for, and then pull those blocks out and display them. There's some really exciting things we can do around AI and using uh, certainly what Google call intent, which is uh, the, the dialogue flow service where we can utilize that intent and really start making this a dynamic service, but that would be the sort of next iteration on this.
So let's have a, a brief look at, at performance. So whilst using the REST API, uh, there's a couple of things that we found that has been really useful um, with regards to performance. So the first is, uh, and I don't think this is going to work because this isn't animated. So again, I'll, I'll talk you through this. Um, the first is when you're creating large JSON objects. So the example that we looked at before was a site in numbers where we're creating a very large um, JSON object. So all those statistics, if you remember, and that data that we then pull into the JavaScript layer. Well, that's a heavy payload. And so we were finding some, some big performance hits. So we've got about four and a half seconds. That could get up to five, six seconds at time. So we started looking at uh, transients, and transients as a, as a way of storing and caching that data. So uh, transients are, are, are a way of, of uh, caching data within the database, temporary data. And so by implementing that, and we can see it here, by implementing that, the transients, we could slash that down to about a tenth of what it was previously, it's about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 seconds. So however, I mean, using transients comes with a number of caveats. You need to be very careful. So we have, um, uh, we need to be aware of the sort of expiry dates of transients. We need to be aware of our uh, bloating uh, of our database. Uh, we also, in fact, if you have a very uh, popular site or you have a lot of users on your site, you need to be aware that if, um, uh, if the, the, the transient doesn't exist, then the user generates that new transient. But if another user comes along at the same time, requests that transient, then they too will be generating that transient. And so what we create is these racing conditions where we have a huge number of people generating the transient and causing our system an, a huge problem. So there's an async transients, which is a 10-up plugin, which sort of addresses uh, some of those issues. There was another saving, a, a nice performance saving that we made. So this is the plugin that, that, that we created at Pragmatic, a very simple plugin. It's a must-use plugin where the, the boot sequence of WordPress, so we go through a, a very standard flow as WordPress um, loads. And for, a, uh, for an API call, or indeed for any call, we, do, we continue with that standard um, uh, boot sequence. However, we created this little plugin where we intercepted an API call. So we recognized that this was an API request. And then when the boot sequence got to the, the plugin folder, we diverge. Uh, so not download these, these unnecessary resources. We diverge and go straight to the construction plugin for that, that, um, for that endpoint. And so that resulted, again, a huge saving. About two-thirds shaved off our performance um, by just intercepting that, those API calls and then diverging and taking them elsewhere. Combining those two services, uh, oh, sorry, those two approaches to performance pay huge dividends uh, when working with the REST API. So here are some resources, um, some uh, information, some dev resources around um, the, the REST API. I'll leave these up on the screen for a second. Um, and then equally here, are, oh, and what I will mention just briefly is the accelerator plugin that I was just talking about is on GitHub. So you're more than welcome to go and have a look at that. And here are some wider resources around uh, the API, including the, some white paper and the Slack channel and so on. So what does Tobrero bring for, for WordPress and for the REST API? Well, for me, I don't think it's important if we move away from uh, the REST technology and we move into an alternative technology. For me, we've, we've created the beginning of something. So we've created this opportunity where we can start looking at uh, sort of integrating with other services, uh, integrating with other software that simply wasn't possible before. We can start collaborating with other agencies and uh, other teams that we weren't able to whilst we were that black box uh, and that monolithic application. And I think this is me and my Guatemalan father-in-law, and I think it's really important not to forget that, and in fact, this is us sharing a moment, and this is made possible by Google Translate and by technology. And I think it's really important to remember the huge human impact that the work that we do can make to people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for saving the moment by improvising. Maybe another 
applause because you did really well. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, we're running late a little bit, but we have time for maybe one or two questions. Long questions with short answers or short questions with a short answer. So, who wants to have it a go? We have mic runners in the venue. There's one here in the middle. Yes. Hello. Thanks for the great talk. Um, okay, you, you mentioned uh, using WordPress as kind of a headless CMS and integrating it that way with other services. Mm -hmm. So, in that scenario, how do you handle, for example, post previews? How do you handle post previews? Post -previews. Reviewing, yeah, previewing content from admin. Excellent. It's a really good question. Um, so, unfortunately, had we had the animated slides, we would have briefly got into this. So, where we were talking about Fairfax, which is that Australian uh, publishing company, where they had that pre existing content API, when the editorial team pulled down the content, so pulled that content back into WordPress, they enriched it within WordPress they would then push it to a preview section of that content API. Now, that section was only accessible on the front end with a, a, a query var that would then enable you to sort of unlock that preview, and so you'd be able to view it in your React front end or your, your standard front end in, in the standard way, and then flag it for publication. And that would then trigger it into the publish section of the content API, and the, the front end would then pull from that published section. So it's, it's a really good question because it is something you need to consider. It, it doesn't, it's not out of the box when you start creating this architecture. So you do need to, if it's part of the publishing flow that's required, you do need to create this dedicated section of the content API for that and for the previews. OK, one more quick one on the side. Can we have a microphone there? Thanks. Um, I'm not an I'm not an uh, uh, WP REST uh, API expert, so so forgive me if, if this question is is uh, perhaps um, um, a bit uh, a bit dumb. Uh, do you have any experience with loading uh, uh, entire entire uh, pages? Uh, through uh, through through WP REST API, is it uh, is it uh, uh, something that uh, REST API allows? And uh, if it does allow, uh, how does it handle uh, page builders? Because uh, page builders are something in in a WP ecosystem that that I, I simply can't can't fit with uh, uh, WP REST and other other uh, uh, changes. Okay, I, Thank you. I, I just missed the key. Was it page builders, did you ask? Uh, page bu yes, page yes. Bu builders like uh, WP okay. Bakery and... Uh, okay, so it, it's, it's an interesting question that, I mean, in, in answer to the first section of your question, we wouldn't use the REST API to pull down the whole page. So it, it's really best to start thinking about your pages as components, and so component elements that might make up the page. Now, those uh, components might have their own REST API calls, or they might be triggered within your JavaScript layer to, to uh, decide which of those components need to be pulled in. You may indeed use a, a GraphQL service, which is where, uh, we won't go too far into that, but it's where components can actually dictate which small section um, of the data they want to, to pull down. So that's really addressing the issue we're just talking about, where you were talking about that sort of component modularized approach. As the page builders, <sighs> would would that be something <laughs> to discuss at the hallway track? No, I'm going to have a go. Can you have a short? I'm go? not a fan. <laughs> I'm going to put that out there now. I, I mean, when you see the output, and I'm not going to mention any names, but when you see the output of some page builders that. They just they take over the content area. Uh, they they just fill it with spaghetti code of short codes and all sorts of other gumph. That then, as developers, we have to unpick and try and turn that back into something that the the system can use. However, 
With that said, I entirely appreciate that for clients, it's a really valuable uh, tool, it's a really valuable interface, and sometimes that's actually a deciding factor for them using WordPress and adopting WordPress. Gutenberg, God bless Gutenberg, I think is going to help us uh, and is going to improve that so we can say goodbye to some of these page builders. But in answer to your question, it's really tricky. If we're pulling, if that data is embedded in the content area and we're pulling in that in via the, the REST API, we're going to have to have some sort of regular expression hell to try and strip out all of that uh, additional data, or we're just going to have to sort of rethink our architecture. And I'd suggest that the latter would be the better solution. So they're not really compatible um, as things stand at the moment. Great question. So I can imagine there are other questions, but we have no time left. So can, will you be at the conference like today and tomorrow? Will you be available for questions? Absolutely. If, yes, so of people course. can just walk up to you and say, like, hi, I want to know something about the REST API, James Bond, Harry Potter, anything? All of the above. All of of the course above. they can. And can they contact you online if they have any questions? Uh, by all means, like yeah. There's some contact details in the corner there. OK. Well, thank you so much. And another applause for Sean Blakely. Thank you. Well done.